Hi everybody, welcome. My name is Asher Anderson from Flora and Fauna of Aotearoa and I'm here today with um, another group of friends to have a good discussion on um, the SNA and unpacking more of the uh, implications for what the significant natural areas um, mapping and surveys um, actually means. Um, so with us today we've got Jamie McFadden, hi Jamie, Annette Malgram and uh, Brad Flutie. So I'd just like to invite Jamie to start us off. Um, Jamie's had quite, um, quite a breadth of experience with the SNA um, and is, um, yeah, has a lot on the, the uh, full implications that people might not really understand um, in regards to surveys and data collections, what it actually means for habitat um, and the costs and a whole range of issues that um, have come out of your experience with the SNAs. Jamie, would you would you share with us a bit about what you went through um, when this process first started for you? Yep, so it started in 1994. So when the Resource Management Act came in, in um, 91, we were one of the first areas to go through the SNA process. Uh, what happened was that uh, my parents have got a, um, or they had a sheep and beef farm, my brother's there now, it's 800 hectares. My parents had left a lot of the native bush and shrublands and wetlands on the farm, uh, even though they were encouraged to clear a lot of those areas through the land development encouragement loans through the 60s and 70s. Um, they turned those loans down for a lot of that native bush country and decided to protect it. So what happened was that... Um, I was on the home farm at that stage, um, helping with my parents. And we got a letter from the council saying that they were going to map, uh, or they had mapped 120 hectares of our farm as SNA. Um, we had allowed surveys, and that was done by the Department of Conservation. I think you've had it done up there, Protected Natural Area Surveys. Yes, yes. And yeah. what happened was we allowed those surveys, whereas quite a few of our neighbours said don't allow those surveys because um, it'll come back to bite you. But we thought that the department were helping us and that there was no risk with allowing these surveys, so we let them on. And the surveys with the field staff from DOC were actually really, really good. They, they were good people. We learned a lot and it was a very positive experience. But what we didn't realise that uh, we knew that our information, survey information, became public information, but we did not realise what the full implications of that was. So anyway, what happened through all the district plan process and the hearings and, and that sort of thing was that the Department of Conservation, this was the lawyers and the policy people, used that survey information to try and capture as much land as they could of ours as SNA. And then we really started to realise, you know, what was happening and did not like what was happening. So we investigated it a lot. And um, and now we've completely changed our view about SNAs and we won't, we'll never allow SNA surveys on our land again, um, just because of the bad experience we had. So we went through the environment court. Um, I represented our family and we got the, the court ruled in our favour because we had asked for that 120 to be reduced down to, um, it was 17 hectares. And eventually the court ruled in our favour. Uh, we went for costs, but unfortunately didn't get costs. Um, so that was the process in terms of SNAs for us at the start. Um, we did have a protest march. We were one of the first protest marches in all oh, 2000. Uh, then what happened was that the council realised that the whole SNA policy wasn't a good policy and they removed all of the mapped SNAs in 2016. So that was a, a plan change process and there was no appeals. It was widely supported amongst the community and there was no appeals. So that's a little bit of the history with the SNAs. Uh, in terms of my work for the last 20 years, my wife and I have been doing um, a lot of environmental work for farmers. So we run an eco-source native plant nursery that we'd set up on the farm. And when some of the local farmers asked if they could buy plants off us, we decided we'd have a change of career and um, get out of farming and, and, and do what we really loved, which was conservation and, and looking after our nature. And so we've got um, or hundreds of clients, um, all pretty much farmers. 
and we do wetlands, uh, native bush, shrublands, uh, restoration plantings, um, weed and pest control, and we provide advice. So we've got a consultancy service where we help farmers understand the values on their land and how to protect those values. And so we've been doing that for the last um, 20 years. And so what I see with the SNA policy, it's, it's actually completely counterproductive to what it's actually trying to achieve, which is to, to look after nature on our land, but it does the opposite. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's probably a summary of, of what, um, there's a lot of implications about SNAs and we could go through these in an interview, but there's a lot of stuff online on our, on our Facebook and website, Rural Advocacy Network, and also on Groundswell NZ. Um, but I probably could answer any questions, but the main thing with the SNAs in terms of implications, I mean, it's a huge cost. Councils are, uh, it's, it's 18 million for Southland District Council is what they've estimated to do their SNA surveys and the whole planning process, but none of that money is actually going into helping helping us look after nature on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. And so how would you see the, um, the habitat? And we're, we're saying there needs to be systems like the QE2 Trust where it works with landowners to help protect nature on the ground. Yep. So you're saying that... So I'll probably leave it at there. That's just a brief summary. <laughs> no worries. Yep. Thank you, Jamie. Awesome. Annette, would you like to introduce yourself and, and share a bit about um, your thoughts on the SNA? Because I know your land has been affected um, also. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, I'm Annette Malgren and I'm a private landowner in the Kayo area. Um, so our property is approximately 70 acres and we have about two to three acres that is not designated SNA, so that means virtually our whole property is, has been uh, captured as an SNA. And a mass capture, and I suspect actually you're, you've caught, you're caught up in the same one, that is actually a area of 22,200 hectares all, all up. So they just did that, that ring around the outside and swept us all up and into something that um, we found out by a letter in the mail. Um, I, I, I reached out to the community after receiving that letter. I was just interested in, in how everybody else was feeling and, and how they, what was their response to that piece of communication from our, our Far North District Council. And um, of course, everybody was mortified. And then I started to hear, we need to get together, we need to get together. So I um, initiated the CAIO meeting, um, which was, you know, well attended and um, I, I, consider a very successful meeting good content came out and um, Jamie came in by video link which was really great and very helpful yeah so um, we've been quietly working away behind the scenes and and working our way through what we captured from that meeting and how we can address that for the people specifically of Whangaroa um, we appreciate it's a nationwide issue but if each area can and, and find a strong core group to come together and find a course of action, then perhaps as regions, we can then come together into a, some kind of a national movement. That's what we're hoping um, will develop over the next few months. We've, we've got some breath catching time, I guess, with the council and, and the government taking a step back and going, whoa, that's a big um, negative response from the public. We better try and rethink our strategy. Um, and of course, the indigenous biodiversity a policy statement that's not out yet. Um, are they trying to uh, sneak SNAs in first and then overlay that over the top, which I think um, is, um, Jamie can probably expand on that a little better for us, hopefully. Um, has some bad, nasty stuff in it for uh, landowners. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you, Annette. <clears throat> yes, I know you've been you've been working very hard um, in Whangaroa to get that message out, and it was a very clear one at the meeting <clears throat> that um, that no, we do not consent. So um, I know that message is going to be taken further. Um, Brad, would you like to share a bit with us about um, how you're getting on? I know you were at the Hikoi as well, um, and uh, we didn't get to catch up with you afterwards. But um, do you want to share some thoughts? Yeah, it just never stops, does it? I mean, I want to talk to everything uh, Jamie and Annette have said. Um, quite glad that we've all come in contact. Um, 
especially a lot of um, Jamie's experience with SNAs, it sort of lines up with all of the, um, the resources and the perspectives from around the country that have been sent to me uh, ever since I did a live video on my concern for it. Um, about, I live on a property close to the Russell State Forest, so I sub my time between here and Tauranga. Um, my mother-in-law owns this property. About 95% of it was designated SNAs. Um, we haven't touched 95% of it anyway. Um, I trap most of it during winter. And um, in fact, a lot of the area that's been cleared for pasture, especially around the stream areas, we want to replant anyway. So first off the bat, I'm, I agree with Jamie. Um, I don't believe that this process is about encouraging or helping people to be better for what is hypothetically designated as significant natural area. Uh, if it was, we'd be getting help. Um, this clearly isn't help. Um, we've seen a lot of different narratives coming out around this. Um, a lot of things that don't really make any sense. Um, if we look at Jamie's example, um, the moment that he was put through this, he's now actually a positive solution. I've had enough of seeing people like uh, James Shaw talk. You know, I want to hear more from people like Jamie who actually have solutions, who are actually helping farmers who, for the most part, actually want to pursue the good if they're given the opportunity. And here's Jamie out there giving them the opportunity. Instead, what I see on television is James Shaw making just a bunch of crap up. And I, I'm sick of it, to be honest. Um, I've come across information that shows that what this is actually really about and it's it's kind of concerning i think it's it's quite uh disgusting that the government thinks it's going to be okay to turn snas into use rights and trade them to urban developers so they can clear um areas that might be of significant natural area around cities so they can make cities larger so when we consider that that part's actually in the SNA process buried in there, um, we, we start to realize that this really doesn't have much to do with significant natural areas, uh, especially when we consider that the people that morally posture for nine years as labor and greens are, are gonna eventually be replaced by people who couldn't give two stuffs about the environment. So uh, is an SNA process about protecting the environment? Look a little bit harder and you know it. It won't, it isn't. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> thanks Brad. Yeah, I think that's something that's actually become quite clear is that this is not in the interests of biodiversity and it, it's discouraging people from planting further native habitat because they then lose control or, or they lose their kaitiaki, you know, rights to look after that habitat. Um, and I think you mentioned in your other interview, Jamie, about lowland scrub that is actually, you know, seemingly um, okay to, to rip out and plant in pines, but actually has significant biodiversity values down in the area where you are. Yeah, and, and just reinforcing what Brad's saying is that that's what I see with this whole SNA policy is where my mind's got to, is that it's not actually about helping people on the land look after the land and nature it's about control it's about capturing your private property information it's about finding out as much as they can about what's on your land but not in a way that's to help you it's actually in a way to control you and I keep asking my question why are they doing these SNA surveys what's the purpose of these SNA surveys and, and it is it's all about that um, it's control and land use uh, control and um, information but just with the shrublands one because that's a really interesting one so in the South Island in our dry sort of hill country we've got a lot of um, different species in our native shrublands and our native shrublands through this area are um, quite unique in the world there's nowhere else like it and there's lizards and all sorts of species that thrive in these shrublands and yet government policy, climate change policy, is encouraging farmers to plant their marginal land, which is where a lot of this um, shrublands are. And we're seeing huge areas of shrublands being overplanted in pines. It just, I keep saying, well, we've got a Labour Greens government in power, 
but they don't really seem to care about the environment. They don't seem to care about people. They don't seem to care about environment. They seem to care about control and ticking boxes, meeting targets. Yeah. So I guess that's a short summary there, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, the, the power and control. I mean, I've just receiving a letter in the mail that, that, that annexes part of your land, you know, and says to you, um, will you confirm if these details are correct and give us more information and then we'll tell you what the rules around it are going to be later on, you know. Yeah. It's, um, you know, and it's very, very discouraging. We heard people at the CAIO meeting stand up and say, look, you know, um, I'm going to actually have to bulldoze through some of some of this so that I can build my house on this land. You know, people who had been invested their lives in, in a piece of land so that their family would be secure for generations to come so that they could live off the land and look after it are actually, you know, having having their um, having their whole land um, categorized as SNA and then being told you can't you won't be able to do anything with it. So yeah. There's, yeah, there's some huge issues around that. It is a real, really discouraging. Um, we had people standing up at the meeting saying, right, I'm only going to plant exotics from now on, you know, and in order to avoid this level of control. And yes. I think what's being missed out in this is that we are all environmentalists. We, you know, the people who live on the land and care for the land are the people who, who know about it and who are actually invested. You know, our home doesn't stop at those four walls. It goes yeah. right out to our boundary. Um, for me, for example, I've allowed regenerating manuka to come right up to my home, like right up to my house. Um, so, you know, I step outside of my home and I'm wondering the next time that they map SNAs, that's, you know, that's going to be included. And so it's just becomes this, um, you know, this dynamic where you actually can't even move within your own, own landscape. Um, <clears throat> and that was another question that I had actually is how, how often are they intending on doing these aerial mappings? Did you have any indication about that, Jamie? Because that's something that hasn't come up at all. Um, um, so what's happening, because we were first in the process in 1994, we've learned a lot about all the other zonings. And what's happened down here is that landowners have got layers and layers of zonings across their land. So it's not just SNAs, it's uh, outstanding landscapes. Um, it's outstanding natural features. There's so many different, some farms around here have got six or seven different zones spread across their land. And that's what's going to happen under this new Indigenous pol uh, Biodiversity Policy Statement due out. It was due out this month, but it's now going to be the end of the year. So the proposals in there, we're talking about not just SNAs, but highly mobile fauna, uh, depleted habitats. There's all sorts of mapping and surveying required under this new legislation. So likes of our farm in terms of highly mobile species the New Zealand falcon is is one of the highly mobile species our farm because we've left all a lot of native bush and we've planted other trees is home to native falcons so our whole farm is could be potentially be recorded as a as a uh, highly mobile species area mm -hmm. our whole farm 800 hectares and then what does that mean in terms of the rules? And the rules change all the time. That's a big problem with the SNAs. Mm. The rules change as councils change, as governments change. So you, you could agree to some rules at some point in time, and then two years later, the rules change again. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <clears throat> and for those of us that are very concerned about the government's current environmental practices, you know, um, and, and campaigns, ideological campaigns like Predator Free 2050, that is very, very concerning, um, you know, especially since they are dominated by um, poisons, you know, their, their whole conservation strategy really at this time revolves around poisons. And so many of us have actually bought habitat, protecting it, you know, keeping it pristine um, in that respect. And so to have to have the, the thought that that rules could come in that require, you know, or that that put pressure on you to actually um, perhaps go against your moral beliefs in how you should manage that habitat is, is very concerning. And I know it's a big concern for many of the people in the area that I live in. Mm. Well, yeah, so, yeah, so just in terms of, uh, one of the things that we're finding is that to look after our biodiversity requires active management. That's the first thing. And to achieve that active management on the farms like we're doing, you, you, you have to empower the landowners. Yeah. So 
otherwise they will switch off. If you don't empower them, they won't actively manage these areas uh, as well as they could. If you if you empower them, like this is what we do, is we empower farmers to, to take pride in their land and to look after areas. And when you do that, they really buy into it and they do so much more to look after the land. The other thing is that we've got a lot of exotic um, species in our country now and we can't turn the clock back and ret return back to what it once was. And so part of that management is learning about how we live with these exotic species. So it, in some places it might be aiming for extermination. In other places it, it might be more about harvesting deer as a, as a food product and, and keeping the numbers at a low manageable level that allows na nature to continue to regenerate because we've got big issues with deer and you can never eradicate all of them, but a lot of people are, are, are doing control work of deer and then using the meat for you know feeding families and friends and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, we, we have to learn how to manage our areas with the, the, the exotic species here as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Annette and Brad, did you have anything else you wanted to, to add to that? I just question um, for uh, oh sorry Brad away you go I was just I was just going to build on what um, Jamie was saying that see this is this is exactly the type of positive solutions that farmers need to see with this SNA process it's essentially a, a psychological uh, what would you call it like a clamp put around farmers and when you do that they don't want to listen um, they want to listen even less and what Jamie is doing instead is, is going along and saying, well, hang on a sec, uh, we could do this, we could do that, we could do this, we could improve your economic potential while doing all these things, and then your values are kept and you feel better about what you're doing. And yeah. that's really the solution here. That we need more people like Jamie, more consultants, more people that are actually coming up with solutions because um, if, you, if you can't get a farmer to listen to you, it's just not going to work. And, and, and SNAs are counterproductive to that. So... Look, that's one thing I've spent a lot of my time working on in the poly house is essentially just trying to um, get more bang for my buck in smaller spaces. So not just growing in a lateral sense, getting some pipes in and some structures and building in a, and growing in the 3D sense so the production is maximized, creating better soil, learning how to do that so it holds more water content. There's yeah. a huge amount of information out there that we can we can impart onto our farmers to increase their production and, and, and give them actually more time so they can do something that makes them feel good about themselves while they're working with the land. Because, you know, we see the, the direct response from these SNAs. It's, a, oh, well, you've squeezed me past breaking point. My values no longer matter anymore. I'm just going to clear all these SNAs and then you can't dictate to me with your tyranny what I can do on my land. But if you flip it, if you change it, and you go, hey, look, you can actually make way more without you even, whilst you're even cr increasing the amount of natural biodiversity on your land, then they might actually listen. Now, governments need to start paying attention to how we get our constituents to listen to be better for everything around them. They're not doing that. And if they continue to do this, they're just going to make things worse. So that's what I got from was ja Jamie was saying, which is really good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it certainly seems that it's it's a, it's a, a divisive, you know, just constant divisive um, policies, you know, rather than actually communicating with people and collaborating and working with people. It's this top down model of, of, of we're just going to tell you how to do it. We don't care what you think. This is this is what we and our experts think. So you guys are going to have to listen to us. And I yeah. think we're past that. We're past that, you know, um, and, and we need to actually to actually work together. And that's that's the way we achieve real outcomes for biodiversity. Um, yeah. And that's yeah, it's a, it's a really important lesson to learn. It's a really just a simple statement. And I was talking to my granddad because I went and visited my granddad down in Taranaki. Um, Taranaki is a place that sort of got cleared and they use lots of DDT and um, then gorse started springing up all over the hillside where it used to be grass and it became a nightmare to manage and granddad got really old and just stopped managing it. Now a lot of the gorse areas is, is coming back in Manuka and Kanuka and natural forests and 
you know, he's gotten a bit sentimental in his old age and he's quite kind of glad that's happened. He sort of said that, you know, for years and years and years I've been fighting this stuff and, you know, look, look what's happened when I've left it and what's come through. Yeah. And so <laughs> what this is, what this is showing us is it, essentially what the government's been doing wrong and what every sort of authority figure has been doing wrong for generation after generation is assuming that tyranny is the best way to get things done. But in reality, what, what, what's actually happening generation after generation is tyranny is creating more trauma and more tyranny and so on and so on and so on. And if the government can't fix, figure this out or people who are aiming for authority figure, figure positions can't figure this out, that the only way to make human beings better for everything around them is to stop tyrannizing them and stop perpetuating the chain of trauma and tyranny. Because if you can't figure that out, it's never going to stop. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think, uh, and, big, and just to add to that, I think something that's really missing from this is that people are so much more aware of their environment now. There are so more people than not are actually, as you say, Brad, pursuing the good on their land, you know, letting areas re regenerate, planting habitat, looking after, doing their trapping, you know. So, and, and we saw it in the far north, you know, last time they did this mapping, um, it was at 30% coverage of, of the far north district was considered SNA. Now we're up to 42% with this latest round of mapping. That's a massive increase. And that's down to community groups, individuals, farmers, landowners, all doing it with, without this overarching kind of, we're gonna cut up and, and calculate and, and categorize everything on your land. We are already doing it. So I think, you know, that needs to be recognized is that assistance that's all we need assistance and education and i and i think that those few people who who are actually you know these kind of policies are designed to catch will be fading out because the yeah. rest of us are all doing the mahi yeah yeah annette did you have a you had a question for for jamie well you know i did over the top of that i just i think empowering farmers is an incredibly powerful um mm -hmm. thing to be doing and, and what and, and you know i mean Every day must be a pretty good day for you, Jamie, and the work that you do with farmers and and um, you know, Maori know how to do it. Maori now they know how to look after the environment. Farmers need encouragement. They're so surrounded by so much BS and legislation coming down on them. Pressure must be huge. Pressure is huge, we know that. I mean, that came through quite strongly in, in, at the Kaio meeting, the distress of the farmers. I think empowering the farmers is, is incredibly powerful in the SNA issue. But my question was, is about the Indigenous Biodiversity Act. Is this a deliberate delay in that because of the step back on the SNA? Is that, uh, is that going hand in hand with that, do you think? Oh, yes. Well, the, the SNA is a part of the Indigenous um, Biodiversity National Policy Statement. Yeah. So the de delay of the Indigenous Biodiversity Policy Statement coming out is probably partly because of what's happened in Northland and with our, our, our moves over SNAs as well. So SNAs are an integral part of that policy statement. Um, SNAs have been around since 1991. But this is a new a new model of SNAs, and it's much it's much worse. It's much wider reaching, and it's going to affect a lot more people. Mm. Yeah. So, in your mind, with what you know and understand and experience, background, which should come first? Which should be implemented first? What well, is wrong with the SNA when we have when we have the yeah, it's more about understanding, and I, I mean, I agree with Brad, he just absolutely nails it. Um, it's more about understanding how you empower people to look after nature on their land. And it goes back to that question, because in some some respects, we need regulation. You know, if it's activities like effluent ponds or irrigation or those sorts of activities, you need the regulations. And then with other things, um, regulation is actually counterproductive. So when you're looking at about land and water and people looking after that, you can't force them to look after it through regulation. You can't force them to take pride in it by using regulation. And so 
it's got to be like I said, Brad's nailed it. You've got to turn it completely on its head. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we do is, and farmers are not, a lot of the farmers around here, they're not looking for an economic return in doing the environmental work. They just want to do the environment work well. Like we've shifted in our headspace, farmers, and a lot more farmers are on board. There's still some bad eggs, but they're getting less. But now what a lot of farmers are thinking is that they, they're prepared to invest in looking after the environment and looking after you know these natural areas, wetlands, but they don't necessarily want to, to get an economic return um, from that work. They just want to look after it. And But what they're instead getting is they're getting more compliance cost. And if you've got large areas of your property mapped as SNAs and like the West Coast, large areas of your property mapped as wetland, it's impacting your land value. And so when people go to go and sell their land and that land that they've cared for maybe through generations has lost value because a council's mapped 90% of it or 95% of it as a as a SNA or wetland, it's so hard on those people that have done all that good stuff. Yeah. So yeah, we've got, to, we've got to turn the legislation completely on its head. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the yeah. the power is with the people who live on the land, and that and yeah. that that gets to the the essence of it. And what you said, you know, regulation can't make you take pride in, you know, it can't give you that connection. Yes. Without that connection, um, yeah. And we, the people on our own land, are the primary ones with that connection, you know. Yeah. Um, but. Your question about regulations, it, I think I'm, we'll ask Jamie maybe to explain a little bit about the groundswell protest that's happening because um, we can see that there's um, there's a lot of unrest um, amongst farmers and, and other landowners and tradies at the moment in regards to what they see as a whole lot of unworkable regulation. Would you mind just sharing with us a little bit about what those regulations in particular are? I know SNAs are one of them, but what, what kind of um, regulations are, are really causing all of this um, unrest? Uh, th this comes about with my role with Rural Advocacy Network. So we're a group that's is set up uh, in 2016 and we, we're just like Federated Farmers, but we're, I guess we're trying to give a stronger voice and we represent anyone in the community, uh, landowners. And what we've found with our work in helping farmers is that there's a huge amount of pressure on farmers now from so many audit processes, so many compliance processes, and they're just overwhelmed. And we're helping quite a few farmers that they're just over it. And I think Katie Milne, who was the president of Federated Farmers, she was the previous pre um, president, she said it quite well that she said, for many farmers, the fun has gone out of farming. And when you say the fun has gone out of something, you've lost your passion, you've lost your drive. That, that's everything. That's everything. And so what we're seeing here with farmers is that they're exiting the industry. We've got young farmers that are getting out because it's just too much. And so what's happening is we've got so many different regulations. You talk about holistic. There's no holistic environmental legislation it's all done in silos so you've got climate change then you've got indigenous biodiversity you've got fresh water and then you've got weeds and pests under the biosecurity act it's connected. all fragmented there's no integration no holistic approach to the environment that says how do we empower and educate and inform people how to look after their their nature on their land so it's a it's a it's actually a whole environmental regulation approach so what farmers are saying we've had enough and we're putting a stake in the ground so I'm our group joined with Groundswell which is Southland Otago and we've now got West Coast we've got coordinators setting up all throughout New Zealand and we've put a stake in the ground and said we've had enough and this is the howl of the protest is us standing up and saying we've had enough so the idea with this protest is right throughout New Zealand, we're getting towns come on board every day. We want it to be peaceful. We want it to be non-violent. Um, it's to be a, a positive protest, but it's going to be a statement that the community have had enough and we want change. So we're, we're committed, Groundswell's committed to carrying this on until we get change because the current model is unsustainable. So this first protest that we're having in July the 16th through towns all throughout New Zealand, 
We're encouraging people to turn up to the towns, but do so in a positive way, like interact with townspeople in a positive way, support the local businesses, go, go out to lunch, um, you know, set the dogs off barking, but a bit of an, uh, you know, interaction between town and country. But if we don't get change, then we're going to have to look at more actions. Mm-hmm. And we are already thinking of more actions to get, get our message heard. Thank yep. you, Jimmy. Yeah, I think it's really difficult for people who live in towns and cities to understand exactly what farmers are going through. Yeah. And and I think there's this sense that we do need to change. You know, the whole the whole planet is going through changes. Our country needs to change. Agricultural sector needs to change. But they don't actually um, know what these changes are should be and the and the compliance and the regulations that are coming in i think there's just an assumption that these are good things yeah there's a complete disconnect from the reality um you know of what it's like for actual farmers yeah. having to go through these processes um and then sometimes actually you know you actually can't comply you know yeah. it, it just becomes an impossible situation which is really um damaging to people's yeah. mental health i know we've heard, heard about that quite a bit as well so So one of the things that's happening now is that the farmers that are struggling the most are our traditional family farmers. And the traditional family farmers are the most environmentally um, switched on and attached to their land people that we work with. Most of our work is with traditional family farmers. They've been on there for generations. A lot of them are high country farmers. Mm -hmm. They've got a real attachment to the land but they, they're not a big corporate structure and they haven't got lots of money. Um, and so they're getting smothered with this compliance and they're the people that are getting out. So we're losing our traditional family farmers and they're being replaced in a lot of cases by corporates, mm-hmm. carbon forestry, overseas investors. Yeah. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing societal change amongst the, the rural part of New Zealand that... People, people need to understand that all these regulations are driving the societal change and it might not need, it's not going to be going in a good direction, I don't think. Yeah, no, it's yeah. not. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to put forward the idea that you um, lock the gate. I think that that needs to be the key word. And if, you, if, you're, if you're familiar at all with the, <clears throat> the anti-fracking um, Australian campaign where there was um, there were were corporations wanting to come onto people's land. They had a very very successful campaign called Lock the Gate. Ah, so lock the gate on the SNAs. Don't yes. let anyone come in and do surveys. Lock yes. the gate. You know, so I think that that you know that could be a real good potential message because um, you know it's it is quite a difficult situation to be in. You know. Um, that's how we that's how we got our district council to change was because all the farmers then got together all the landowners got together and said we're not allowing any more surveys and we had a shut the gate campaign and we, a lot of us got signs on our gates and we said no more surveys no more access yeah and yeah. that's when we really started to get change so groundswell has put that out as a as a national action now we're calling for all farmers to lock their gate, not only on SNA surveys, but wetland surveys, anything to do with surveys of natural areas on your land, um, shut your gate. Yeah. And we see that as a, this is a temporary thing until the regulations change to respect, well, pretty much respect people. Yeah. 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 yeah that's what's missing in this whole thing, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, thank you guys. If there's anything else um, anyone wants to add before we maybe... But so just keep making a noise, Jamie. Just keep making a stand. And just keep. and and actually, you know, my concern is with the step back from the Far North District Council and the government in general on the SNA issue is that people are going to go back to sleep. So I think let's we need to get some signs up. And we need to keep the issue in front of people because it's it's not going to go away. Yeah, that's no. my worry that people are going to you know get lulled into a false sense of security. And um, all of a sudden, mm. yeah, yeah. Well, ground right. groundswell is not going to go away. We are at, we're absolutely committed to seeing change, and we look forward it's, to your North Island tour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How can yeah. we make that happen? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe after July the sixteenth. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, yes. I'm going down to Kerry Kerry in my ute with my dogs with the windows down. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah well, I'm going to put some native plants in the back and, um, yeah, head into town. Yeah, might put yeah. a, a no ECNAs poster or sign on my car somehow. And, yeah. yeah. So the protest, the protest has been sort of advertised by some media as being a protest about the utes and the ute tax. Yes. yes. But, 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 but it's not. Our main issues are the, just the smothering effect of all these regulations and how they're so poorly designed. I suspect that the ute tax out of all the issues that farmers and, and, and landowners are issuing is, is probably almost the smallest issue of it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. still, it, it's just another cost on, on, I mean, we use utes with our business. We're planting hundreds of thousand native plants on farms. Utes are so vital to us being able to get out and help farmers restore nature. Um, so they're they're an essential item. We can't we can't do this work in an EV. I mean, time will change. We'll probably get the technology at some point in time, um, but it depends what the cost of it is too. Well, that's right. You know, to get an EV and do what our vehicle. Utes do. You see, yep. you see, just adding adding some money onto onto the cost of a Ute doesn't stop people in the city who don't need them, you know, buying them and yeah. driving around in them. And so, you know, once again, it's a, it's another policy that doesn't hit the spot that it's supposed to hit, and it punishes people, you know, financially punishes people who are already suffering. So it's just yeah, no wonder it's the cheap. I also, I also think EVs are entirely impractical for a nation that sequesters about 140 million. Um, tons of CO2 per year yeah. like uh, and, and and then you go and have a look at our estimated um, release of CO2 it's 79.8 million tons of CO2 per year so yeah. it, look this is why I was listening to Jamie list out the, the the goals the environmental goals of councils and they all seem to work at cross purpose or the, the, their angles to address it all seem to work at cross purposes to one another yeah so it, it's all very confusing yeah i'm going to have to head away um yeah. if that's the right guys yeah, but... yeah, absolutely let's let's finish up now um thank you so much guys for for joining us and for sharing i think it's so important just to keep these conversations going especially for people that are not getting this kind of information so thank you all and um yeah let's do it again and definitely yep. some of those other topics too jamie the solution side of things you know that's yep. where our focus really needs to head as well so thank you brad thank you jamie thank you annette thank you, thank you. Cool. Enjoy the rest of the day and I'll um, hopefully pop this up later today to share. Okay. Thank you. Well, Bye right. now. Thanks, guys. Bye.